Awesome. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Morning. Good, good, good. That good, huh? All right. Well, we're going to try that again. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? All right. Yes, it is Palm Sunday. Did everybody get a palm branch? Let me see them. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, this is so fun. That's so great. Well, Today is the day we're going we're gonna to hear from the Gospels the story of Jesus' triumphal entry. We, we celebrate that he is our king and he's our savior. And so you're welcome to use these throughout worship. The kids are going to be coming later up uh, and they're going to come and sing a, a song with palm branches. And you guys are uh, welcome to join in the fun at that time as well. But um, first of all, we're going to all stand up and we're going to just enter into the Lord's presence with worship today. So stand with us. Is that for Trish? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. 
is so good to see you guys. You know, these are really cool. I'm just saying, I feel like a child going like this, knowing that Jesus was walking and people were like, hallelujah, hosanna, hosanna, hosanna. I love it. So feel free to be a child. <laughs> I mean, Jesus does tell us to be childlike, right? It's true. Yeah. I mean, really. So this is from Matthew 21. I'm so excited to see all of you. I haven't been back for weeks because I'm so, I'm recovering from ACL reconstructive surgery. <laughs> so it's so cool to be back and see everyone. I love you guys, my family. Amen. Yeah. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mountain of Olives, Jesus said to disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
let's all yell Hosanna and wave this sucker. Hosanna! I love it. One of the things I love most about Palm Sunday is it's the beginning of this really special week in the life of the church, a holy week. Right, And every single day we can read in scripture kind of this, this journey of Jesus going to the cross and very intentionally knowing that he's going to lay down his life, right? Even as he's riding on the donkey into Jerusalem, that he knows that there's, you know, an end that's not, you know, this, this glorious thing for a season. There's going to be pain and suffering. And yet he was so willing to lay aside his glory in heaven to come and be that sacrifice for us. And so we we just take this time to remember that, right? We're going to take communion later on in the service and it's so fitting to to, you know, take communion as we remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for us. And and right now in this time of worship, we remember and we behold our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords who came as a baby and then lived a perfect life, and then went to the cross so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. So as we sing this next song, I just pray that you can take a moment in the busyness of life to just ponder and to reflect on Jesus and his incredible sacrifice that he has made for each one of us. Before there was light, walked across the pages of time. He who made every living thing, behold him. He who heard humanity's cry, left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us, behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah.
thank you for Palm Sunday. I thank you that knowing today, back in the day, what you were going to do for us and you were still willing to do it. I thank you for walking that road, giving us salvation and freedom and the lives that we have today, Lord God. You are worthy of all our praise and we just scream out Hosanna to give you honor and glory, Lord God. You are holy, you are the Alpha and the Omega, you are the Son of God, you are our Messiah. And I just pray, Lord, that today our hearts would be changed for you, that we would feel a part of something bigger, that we would know that your kingdom rules, that you are on your throne, and we just need to surrender to you, Lord God. I pray over the service that you would just speak mightily in our hearts and our minds, and anything that is hindering us from hearing your word and your truth would just be broken right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the freedom that we have to come before you and to worship at your throne. We love you and we praise you. And in Jesus' name, we all say, amen. All right, say hi to like five people around you. Good morning, church. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Boy, isn't it great being here? Wow. My name's Skip. I'm one of the elder elders uh, of a group of six of us. Just being honest. Uh, one of two elder elders. I won't mention who the other one is, but uh, you all can figure that out. Hey, welcome to church. Uh, glad to have you here on winter break. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to welcome <laughs> our, uh, like to welcome back our staff, Hillary and Matt, uh, escaped to uh, Arizona, warm weather. Uh, Kathy and Kelly, they chose to go the other direction to cold weather. But welcome back, y'all. Welcome back to the group that went to Portland uh, and got back safely. Okay, well, we like to start off uh, every Sunday with our announcements, and we always begin with the connection card. You will find these in your seat or maybe in the pocket in front of you, especially for you who are new, first-time visitors. We would really welcome some information from you. Uh, so we can be in contact with you and uh, let you know what's going on here at Compass. Uh, also, on the back of the card, we um, have a place for prayer requests, which we honor just so much to not only pray for what you've got going on, but we like praise reports, anything great happening in your life, what God has blessed you with. So please feel free to... Fill these out. You can drop them in the basket for offerings, or there's a box in the back you can put them in uh, as you're leaving. Uh, Mike Miller. Mike, do you come up, please? Hey, Compass. Uh, just a quick announcement. Tomorrow night is our uh, NCAA men's tournament uh, game. 
Uh, game starts at like 5.20, but I think we'll get, or sorry, 6.20. Uh, we'll start getting things going around 5.30, uh, and we'll eat at 6. So we're going to eat before we uh, watch the game. So I uh, hope you can make it. That's tomorrow night, about, uh, like I said, 5.30. And uh, invite a friend. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I digress. Let me go back to the connection card, and I, for, I forgot to mention the Compass app. That is something that we are very happy with, and uh, you can get online and download that app, and it's got all kinds of information how you can be involved and send us prayer requests, all those good things, so feel free to download that and uh, use it. Oh. <laughs> okay, Mike, I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Please sign up so we know how many people are coming. Uh, I'm sure we have plenty of food. Um, Joanne Nyquist, I'd like you to come up and talk about the women's ministry. Thanks, Kip. Good morning, Compass. I'm here again to invite all the ladies to our spring Bible study. We have one session, um, All Things New. It's a study on 2 Corinthians that starts this Tuesday in the morning, 10.30 to 12. And it's uh, an eight-week study. It goes through May 23rd. Uh, in the evenings next week, so April 11th, the evening group will start, and they're going to be studying Hosea, uh, Unfailing Love Changes Everything, seven-week study, and it also ends on May 23rd. You're all welcome. We have books in the back. Come sign up. Join us when you can. If you can't make all of them, don't worry. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Okay, a reminder. Next week is what? Yeah. We have one service, 10 a.m. We encourage you all to invite friends, neighbors, family members who might be in town, but uh, we'd love to have you. It's one service. Like I said, at 10 a.m., we have uh, cards around that have invite me, so you can pick those up and hand those out and feel free to just, you know, go through your neighborhood and knock on doors and invite them. I'm going to pray for our service as Matt comes forward now with uh, the message. Father, again, we are so thankful to be in your house uh, today, the Lord's Day. Uh, we are so thankful for those who have uh, served in Portland uh, this week and returned home. We, uh, again, are thankful for this uh, freedom to come here and worship and sing praises to you. We are so blessed, and we... Uh, appreciate and love you, Father, and thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Skip. As he said, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm excited to be here with you on this Palm Sunday. As you can tell with all our palm branches, we're excited to have those. Hopefully you have one. If not, you can get one, get one. Uh, before the end of the service. We're going to be using those throughout the service. Um, this is also the first Sunday of the month, and on the first Sunday of the month, we do communion here as a church family. Um, and when we do communion, we do it towards the end of the service, but that makes us move our tithe and offering to the beginning of the service. So we're going to call up our ushers to take our tithes and offering today. If you're a guest here today, we're just excited that you're here, and we just don't feel obligated to give. Just let that basket pass on right on by you, and if you're filling out a connection card but it's not quite done yet, feel free to finish filling that out, and you can put it in the box that's actually on your way out um, as, you, as you exit the building. <clears throat> but today is Palm Sunday. It's a special name. It's the Sunday before Easter, which is actually, before I came to faith, the only thing I thought Palm Sunday was. It must just mean, in, in Hebrew or something, it must mean the Sunday before Easter. Who knows? Uh, but when I came to faith and I dove into kind of what what is Palm Sunday and what, what, what's its significance? Um, I realized it's also the Sunday that launches off something that some Christians and believers celebrate called Holy Week. It's Holy Week. And we get into, we'll get into all these terms, what they mean for the followers of Jesus and those exploring Christianity as we move through this series, which is a new series called Made New. It's a five-part series. It's going to be our Easter series. But today, 
We started. We started a week before Easter because the events leading up to Easter are important as well. And typically, churches do one of two things for Easter Sunday. When they're planning for this, this greatest of Christian holidays, a Sunday morning when, when people might come to church who might not otherwise come to church, they either do a one-off sermon, it's a one-part sermon where they just they, they give the message, you don't have to have been here the week before, you don't have to be here the week after, you can come that one week and you're good. Or they start a series in an effort to try to entice people who were visiting church for the first time to come back the next week and, and maybe the next week after that and the next week after that and then, and then call this church their family. Here at Compass, we've done both of those things. But this year, it's a little bit different. And as you may know, I'm not really your typical pastor. I'm a little different. And that's not positive or negative. I'm not saying either way. It's just, just the way it is. But because I'm not your typical pastor, I sometimes do things in an unorthodox way. That's just the way I operate. And this year's Easter series falls under that moniker. But I, I would contest that the format here this week, this year, makes a lot of sense. And I think it makes a lot of sense because, well, otherwise, why would we be doing it, right? I mean, here we are. But I came up with this technique because I thought it was important to talk about the events that lead up to Easter as well as Easter itself. Easter is the defining holiday of what it means to be Christians. It's why, it's why we celebrate on Sunday instead of Saturday like they did before the resurrection. But the events that lead up to that are also important. They're important to understand. But to be honest, I wasn't quite sure how to do this series. I wasn't quite sure how to do it in a way that that gives you something to think about this week while at the same time inviting people next week for the first time without them feeling like they've missed something. Man, I know what it's like to sit down in the middle of a movie and try to figure out what's going on. It's horrible. I remember when I was young, my my mom and I and my, my brother got tickets, free tickets to the movies, and we were excited to go. We didn't typically go to movies, but we were excited to go. However, we misread the starting time of the movie. So we showed up to this movie. It was a movie called The Never-Ending Story. Has everyone ever seen The Never-Ending Story? I saw, I saw it in the movie theater. I can assure you that it does end, and actually, often, it starts again in about 45 minutes. So not only is it not The Never-Ending Story, it's also The Restarting Story. But The Never-Ending Story was a great movie, and what I realized is when you get into a movie late, other than not knowing what's going on, You also learn the ending before the beginning, and sometimes that's difficult. So with this particular Easter series, I wanted to figure out a way where I could teach and challenge the people that are here on this Palm Sunday, and at the same time, honor and accept those people who might show up for the first time next week, so they don't feel like they're sitting in 45 minutes left of Never Ending Story without seeing the whole thing for the first time. And then it hit me. As I, was, as I was reading a book by the pool last week in Tucson, Arizona, 82 degrees, <laughs> while you guys were shoveling through fourth, fourth winter, which actually, fifth winter happened this morning. Actually, when I got here, uh, Skip, who did announcements, said, he said, hey, welcome back. I'm so sorry. And I said, are you sorry because Miami lost basketball yesterday or because it's snowing today? He said, both. <laughs> <clears throat> But as I was sitting down at the pool reading this book, I realized that this series could start like the introduction of a nonfiction book starts. Because let's be honest, you don't have to read an introduction to a nonfiction book in order to get the meat of the book. You can skip right over the introduction and start reading at chapter one. After all, that's why it's called chapter one. But I don't know if you're a reader or not, and I'm, I don't know if you, if, even if you consider yourself a reader, are you a nonfiction reader? Or are you one of those people who like fiction stories, you know, those glorious stories where two people come together and they fall in love, battling the greatest of odds to do so, or if that's just my wife. But as for me, I'm a lover of nonfiction. I love nonfiction. I pick them up, I can't put them down, but sometimes it's hard to read. And it's hard to read for two reasons. One, I'm not a very fast reader. I actually read really slowly, and it's frustrating at times. But the thicker the idea in that book, the slower I have to read it, and the slower, the, because it takes me that long to understand what's going on. But it's for this reason why I'm so thankful for a good introduction to a book. Because it kind of sets the stage for what's about to happen. So I don't have to take everything in in the single chapter that comes in. I can take things in a little bit beforehand. And then when the, when the event comes up, I understand a little bit more what's going on. But like I said, the introduction to a nonfiction book isn't necessary for the book. You don't need to read it. If you don't read the introduction, you would still understand the, the bulk of the book. 
But what it usually does is it sets the stage for the reader as they embark the chapters they're about to read that follow the introduction. I know of plenty of people who love reading nonfiction books like I do, and they skip right over the introduction all the time. And then they finish the book before me, which leads to a little bit of frustration, but I read the introduction, and I remind them of that. (laughs) But when you skip the introduction, you, you don't miss any of the meat of the book, but you miss out maybe in understanding the purpose of the book from the start. The reason why the author felt obligated to write this book, or why, why he felt it necessary to explain what he's about to explain. The introduction sets the stage for the information that you're about to encounter. And I'm one of those guys who not only likes to learn sometimes, but likes to learn why he's learning, or what he's learning about, before he learns it. Pretty high maintenance. But reading the introduction leads me to a position where I actually want to read the book more. Or, even sometimes, I'll read the introduction and say, you know what, this isn't the book I thought it was, and I put it down and don't read it. The introduction helps me make that, that decision. My hope is today that this is the kind of introduction that leads you not only to want to come back for the rest of the series, but invite people to read the rest of the story as well. That's what I'm hoping for today. So next Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday, and that's one of those days that people are often willing to say yes to coming to church when they typically might be inclined to decline your invitation. But instead, sometimes on Easter, they'll say, okay, it's Easter, maybe they'll have some chocolate eggs, I'll go. (laughs) Just for the record, if your friends want chocolate eggs, we'll buy chocolate eggs. But today's sermon is one you can share with your friends a little bit about what the whole series is going to be about. And that's what I'm hoping today is. As I said earlier, they refer to this Sunday as Palm Sunday. But where does that name come from? And I think sometimes it's it's (laughs) from the palm branches, thank you. Sometimes I think it's oversimplified to the point that we don't really realize what the people who saw this event 2,000 years ago were really going through. So today I, I want to dive into this. I want to I dive into the shoes of the people that actually laid down these palm branches and their cloaks in front of Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. To be honest, even the people closest to Jesus couldn't quite understand what his role of king truly meant. So on the way into church today, we hand you some palm branches to help celebrate Palm Sunday. And now that we put the palm in your hand, let's put you into the shoes of the people who celebrated this first Palm Sunday. Now, the Palm Palm Sunday event is actually located in all four Gospels. Today, we're going to read out of John, the Gospel of John. And it starts in chapter 12. And as you're turning to John 12, listen to this. The account we're about to read today of of Jesus entering Jerusalem. A lot of times it's it's subtitled triumphant entry. It's found in all four Gospels. Not everything that happens in one Gospel is explained in another Gospel, but this event is explained in all four of them. And each account differs just a little bit, as you expect from different people's accounts. As different people saw this or, or, or heard about it or researched it, there's, a little, there's some small differences. And, and oftentimes, people use that as a reason to dismiss the story of Jesus. There's a crime scene investigator named J. Warner Wallace. You may know who he is. He has a book called Cold Case Christianity. He's a CSI. And he was really good. And as a committed atheist, Wallace actually used the eyewitnesses eyewitness accounts presented in the gospel, he measured them and used the same tests he would on the statements made by witnesses or or participants in homicides in his crime scene investigation. And after a thorough investigation, Wallace became a devout Christian. He moved from committed atheist to devout Christian because it was, quote, evidentially true. As he researched this, he realized that the accounts recorded in the Gospels are more reliable because they are written from authentic points of views. Because they differ slightly, they are more trustworthy. Because if they wrote the exact same thing, it would be conspiracy. But because they differ slightly, he said that it's evidentially true to believe that Jesus existed, that he died on a cross, and that he rose again three days later. It's pretty neat. But these are the kind of things I nerd out a little bit on, and hopefully that gave you enough time to get to John 12. So here we go. In John 12, starting at verse 12, we read this. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. 
So they took branches of palm trees and went out and met him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on, don- on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that he had said these things that were written about him and had done them and had been done to him. The crowd had been with him as he called, or sorry, let me start again. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard what he had done in this, in this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that we are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So Jesus is, this is one of the accounts, one of the four accounts in the Gospels of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. You heard Trish read from Matthew earlier today. Luke's got an account, and so does Mark. The feast that brought everyone here together in Jerusalem is the Passover celebration. And actually, that's the reason why uh, we celebrate Easter on different dates. It's because the Passover moves. But Passover commemorates the final plague that freed the Jews from Egypt. The final plague was the death of all firstborn in Egypt, but God told Moses that the death would pass over the homes if the Jews followed the specific commandments that the Lord gave. So all the firstborn Jews lived, and Israel celebrates this every year and continues to do so. People still celebrate Passover today. Even even some Christians celebrate the Passover. That's actually the reason the date of Easter changes every year because Passover is based on a lunar calendar, whereas our modern calendar is more solar. solar. But anyway, all these people have arrived in Jerusalem and and they hear about all these things that, that Jesus has done. Some of them were even there when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb after being in there for four days. And actually, in that account, it's actually just the chapter before, we see that Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb after four days, and when they remove the stone, everyone says it's going to smell really bad in there because he's been dead for so long, but Jesus calls him out. And that single event caused people to want to see Jesus even more. They see the miraculous signs. They understand that there's something different about this guy. Maybe he really is the king that we've been expecting. Imagine hearing from people you trusted this man, a Jewish man born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth, was performing all kinds of miracles and fulfilling all these prophecies. Imagine further that you've been under the impression of a heinous empire that not only views you and your people as subhuman, but may even kill you because you're not worshiping Caesar as God. That's the mindset of some of these people. And they're desperately hoping that this man who does come from the line of David, the greatest king Israel ever had, who claims to be one with God, came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, just like Zechariah 9.9 said. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As I read through this story, I can't help but have sympathy for these people. They want a savior. They desperately want a savior. But their idea of what a savior is isn't the the idea that Jesus has for what a savior is. These people wanted a king so desperately. They wished and they prayed for the Messiah. And here he was, fulfilling scripture just as they had hoped, fulfilling scripture so people would recognize that he actually is the one sent from God. But the issue here is, and we know now, but they didn't know then, That Jesus told everyone who would listen as well that the king that these people wanted was a political savior, not a personal savior. And Jesus would tell people, anyone who would listen, even people who wouldn't, he would tell them that he's not a political king. He's a personal king. He's he's more than that. His his idea of, of being a king is so much more than just overthrowing this Roman Empire. But that's not what people wanted. People people wanted something for the now. They they wanted something for the here and now. What Jesus was offering was something eternal. And oftentimes we're blinded by our current situations and we can't see the eternal. 
So I have sympathy for this crowd. I understand what that's like. I've been in situations where the current situation prevents me from looking ahead. It's something so dire and so bad and so aggravating that all I do is think of the here and now. And I can imagine that most of the people that are laying down palm branches and laying down their cloaks and singing Hosanna and excited that their king is now here is so focused on the here and now, they missed eternity. They missed eternity. The issue isn't explored much because the Palm Sunday passage is typically thought to be over and done at verse 18 and 19. But this morning I say to you that Palm Sunday is just the introduction. That's what it is. It's an introduction to a new way of life. It's an introduction to a new way of living. That Sunday morning ride on a donkey that Jesus ushered in something different. Not only the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry, which there's a lot that happens between Sunday and Friday, and a whole lot more that happens on Sunday next week. But it also ushers in a doorway to an eternal kingdom that Jesus promised. So today, as, as we look at this introduction, and as we think about what, what this is saying, I want to I close with a thought. The thought is this. Who's the Jesus on the donkey? Who's Jesus on the donkey? A lot of these people really wanted Jesus to ride in on a war horse, conquering Rome. But he rode in on a donkey. So who's this Jesus on the donkey? One of my burdens, not just as a pastor, but as a Christian, is that people know and understand the real Jesus Christ. That's a passion I have. I think there are a lot more people in this world who say they know Jesus than who actually know Jesus of the Bible. I think there's a whole lot more people that that form Jesus to what they want Jesus to be rather than diving into Scripture and see what Jesus is, which is far greater than what we could ever imagine Jesus being. I believe that wholeheartedly to be true. I can't tell you how often I hear people or read people's social media posts or beliefs and, and they talk about their Jesus. Well, my Jesus would say this, or my Jesus would do this, or my Jesus, my Jesus. Well, listen, and I mean this with as much love as I can possibly muster up. If your Jesus doesn't match Jesus of the Bible, your Jesus ain't Jesus, and your Jesus is too small. Now, you may wonder why this is such a burden for me, because, well, it's because the gospel of the real Jesus is good news. Our, one of our church mottos is, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. The good news is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is life-changing. The good news is soul-saving. It, if it isn't the gospel revealed in Scripture, if it isn't the gospel that Jesus preached, then it isn't life-saving. It's just misguided. People can choose to follow Jesus. They can choose to walk away from Jesus. But my burden is to make sure you make that decision understanding who Jesus actually is, not your made-up Jesus. So who is this Jesus on the donkey? Who is he? Well, how about we let him answer? And today I want to do something a little bit that's not quite a, a Palm Sunday tradition. I want to go over the, quickly the seven statements in the Gospel of John that are referred to as the I Am Statements. Super quick. Jesus talks about who he is. And this isn't an inclusive list of everything Jesus is, but it will certainly help us understand him a little bit more as Easter approaches. There are seven of them. If you're a note taker, get ready to write because we're going to move quick. Number one, in John 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never hunger thirst. Jesus is not speaking here of a physical hunger or a physical thirst. This verse actually comes immediately after Jesus feeds 5,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. He can clearly feed people their physical food or drink. I mean, there were enough leftovers that day to feed people for days afterwards. But Jesus wants to understand that with him, You will no longer hunger or thirst spiritually. Your soul will no longer be hungry. Your soul will no longer thirst because he himself can sustain our soul fully and completely. 
So go ahead and eat your bread and fish. But let Jesus fill your soul. That's the first one. The second one comes in John 8. And it says, he says, I am the light of the world. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Without the real Jesus, we continue to stumble around in the dark. And it amazes me how humanity, myself included, because I am in fact human, how humanity continues to stumble around in dark and not ask for light. We continue to do it. But Jesus says he is the light. He's the light of life. And if you follow him, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have light. Our soul cannot live in the darkness. Our soul can only live in the light. And we must follow Jesus if we want that light. Three, depending on what version of the Bible you have, this might say something different. So it might say, I am the sheep gate, or it might say, I am the door of the sheep. Either way, it's the gate where sheep walk in and out. In in chapter 10, verse 7, it says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come to me are, I'm sorry, come before me, are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and in and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. There's only one door for you to have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is it. Number four. And I said we're going to move through these quickly. These, these are the I am statements. Number four, the next verse, to add clarity to what's going on here, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's a big statement there. There's a scene in the movie called, uh, a movie called Jesus Revolution. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It was recently on. Actually, it did a whole lot better in the box office than anybody thought, which is awesome. But there's a leader of a group of hippies. He's having a conversation with a pastor. And he is asked by the pastor of the church how he sees his people. This, this leader of the hippies is asked, how do, you see, how do you see your people? And this is his answer. I see them as sheep without a shepherd. I see them as sheep without a shepherd. That's all of us without Jesus. That's all of us. This is a reference to the, to the leaders of the church in the movie. And the leaders of the church being the shepherd, it's a role that we assume and we pray to God that we fulfill well but our role is not leading sheep to us. Our role is leading sheep to the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. We are merely a sign. Only through him can we, the lost and wandering sheep, be found. He's the good shepherd. Five. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. This one hit me upside the head when I was studying it a little bit. In, verse, in chapter 11, verse 25, just the chapter before we read about Jesus' triumphant um, entry into Jerusalem, it says, Jesus said to her, this is the brother, uh, sister of Lazarus, Lazarus, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall not die. Do you believe this? Jesus is talking to the sister of Lazarus, who who just lost her dearly loved brother. He's been dead for a few days, and Jesus comes up a few days late in her mind, in everybody's mind, comes up a few days late. And needless to say, this question is a difficult question for Martha to answer. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And she's in her mind, she's still grieving the death of her brother. And he asks her, do you believe this? And she's staring at Jesus. And you know what she says? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. She doesn't reply with, you are the resurrection and the life. 
She replies with, I believe you are the Christ. Again, who Jesus is is a lot bigger than sometimes we want to think or imagine. He's the Christ. And Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb, and Lazarus walks out, his hands bound, his, his feet bound. He calls for their, the bandages to be taken off. It's no surprise why so many people showed up to Jerusalem a couple days later when Jesus rides in on a donkey. This guy just resurrected or resuscitated, depending on what words you use here, a man from the dead. He's been dead four days. He stunk. The Bible says it smells bad in there because dead people stink. But he says, roll it away anyway. Lazarus, come out here. And he comes out. And everyone's like, whoa, maybe this Jesus guy's for real. But still, they're wrap, trying to wrap Jesus up in their own package. They're trying to put him in, in their own box. These five statements that we've gone over so far, one, two, three, four, five, they all come before Jesus rides a donkey in Jerusalem. These are the five statements before the triumphal entry. The next two statements come between his entry in Jerusalem and before he goes to the cross. As Jesus rides his donkey in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, people are still looking for Jesus to be a political figure, to overthrow the government, to assume an earthly king, or be a leader in an earthly sense. The final two I am statements come between this ride and Good Friday. Number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus continued saying, no one comes to the Father except through me. Man, I've I've seen this verse, this is one of my favorite verses, but I've seen this verse used in so many ways. Some good, some nasty. Sometimes it's used only to beat people up. Sometimes it's used to support one side of a discussion or an argument. However, it's important for us to realize the hymn that Jesus is speaking to. This, this verse starts out with, Jesus said to him. Who is Jesus talking to? Well, Jesus is responding to a question that one of his disciples asked a disciple named Thomas. You may know Thomas from his nickname, Thomas the Doubter or Doubting Thomas. That's his nickname. He didn't have the nickname yet, but he spoke out. He asked a question. He said, Lord, how do we know where you're going? How can we know the way? Jesus says, I'm going to leave and you guys can come too, but you'll come later. And he asked, well, how do we know? It's a valid question. How do we know? This is the same Thomas that said he wouldn't believe that Jesus was resurrected until he saw the scars in Jesus' hand and in his side where the spear pierced him. The same Thomas that garnered this nickname, Thomas the Doubter. So what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do with this doubter? He said, you doubt too bad. No, he didn't. He said, hey, check out my scars. Here are my hands. Here's my side. Check it out. Blessed you who have seen and blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. He showed up to Thomas. He showed his scars to Thomas. This is a statement which is often used as a way of telling people they can't get to heaven any other way, which is accurate. That is an accurate statement. But it needs to be shared with as much love as Jesus shared it with doubting Thomas. We, and myself included, need to share this verse as an invitation for people who don't know the way to the Father. Not just tell them, your way doesn't work. You need to help them understand in a loving way, there is a way, and it's Jesus. And the last one, the last I am statement, says, I am the true vine, in John 15. The very beginning of this chapter, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. It continues, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This statement comes shortly before Jesus is arrested. 
It's one of those statements that he gives his disciples. And he, he gives it to them to ensure them that even though you don't, under, you don't understand right now what's about to happen, even though I've told you countless times what's going to happen, even, even though we've gone over this, I need you to understand that you'll conti- you can continue to be a part of the vine. You can continue to be a part of me, in me. You can remain in me, even after the unthinkable happens. Even after you see me die on a cross, you can still remain in me. There's a significance to these statements that's often missed on non-Jewish readers. And every time Jesus begins these statements, he's pointing the listener's eyes back to himself as God in light of the Old Testament. When God identified himself to Moses in that whole burning bush situation, Moses asked, how, who, who will I tell people sent me? Who sent me? How can, I, how can I tell them that it's God talking to me? And God responds with, I am. I am sent you. God names himself, I am. And each one of these statements begins with, I am. It's not a coincidence. But just to make sure, there's another place that Jesus uses the phrase, I am. And it comes before any of, these, any of these statements. It's in John 8. In John 8, while talking to some religious leaders, Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He says, I am. He says, I'm God. And some people will say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. It's right here. Well, maybe, maybe his audience didn't think he was God. Well, If you keep on reading, the reaction of the crowd that he's speaking to picked up rocks to stone Jesus for blasphemy because he was making himself equal to God. But Jesus slipped away. It wasn't his time yet. Ultimately, this this claim, this, this claim to be God, this claim to be I am, is what Jesus gets arrested for. Ultimately, he gets arrested on the charge of blasphemy. We'll talk about that next week because that's the Good Friday talk. So who is this Jesus on the donkey? Who is he? He's the great I am. He is God. He is the only permanent answer to sin and death. And we can search, and we can can scrounge around in the dark, looking for other answers, but there is no other answer. He is it. He's the answer. But like I said, we'll get into that next week. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us these statements to understand who you are in a real-world sense so we can apply them to our lives. Lord, each one of these applies to us in different ways in different times of our lives, but they are all equally true all the time. And Lord, even though sometimes we don't realize it, we don't want to admit it, who you are is so much grander than who we believe you to be sometimes. You are a God whose ways are above our ways. You are a God who understands things that we possibly couldn't. Your mind is infinite and ours is not. But Lord, sometimes in our arrogance, we believe that it's not. We believe that we wholeheartedly can understand you and put you in our box that we've created. Whether that's a a political king, an overthrower of some oppressive government, or something that deals with us personally in 2023. Lord, you're so much bigger than we give you credit for. And Lord, I thank you for being so much bigger than I can think of. Lord, we love you. And as we walk through this week up to Easter, up to Good Friday, Lord, we thank you for your willingness to go to the cross, to do something that we couldn't do. Lord, we can come to you and gain forgiveness for our sins in a permanent status only because of what you did we cannot work our way back to the father we can only get there because of who you are that in your foreknowledge before any any sin ever entered this world lord you came up with this idea and lord it's its size is so grand it's hard for us to accept Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us understand this, even in the slightest. 
Lord, we love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we are going to uh, prepare our hearts for a time at the Lord's table. We call that communion here at Compass. And as Matt pointed out today on Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. And uh, it's an interesting story in a lot of ways, but you remember that he told his disciples, two of them, hey, go find this donkey. And when you find it, just tell the owner that, that you know, the Lord needs it. And they did. And they brought this donkey back. And there's a reason why Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem. I read an article this past week, and the guy gave basically eight reasons why Jesus had to ride the donkey. One was to fulfill prophecy, but there were other reasons that went along with that. And the one that kind of stood out to me was this. It was the fact that um, when Christ rode that donkey, it kind of makes us look back to another story in the Old Testament. We call that like a foreshadowing. Like, here's a story in the Old Testament that we see is lived out in the life of Jesus. And we call that, like, there's people that we would say they're a type of, of Christ, a type of Jesus. And one of those people in the Old Testament is Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. And if you remember Isaac and Abraham's story, God spoke to Abraham and he basically said, I want you to take your son, your only begotten son, and I want you to go to the mountains of Moriah, a three-day journey, and I want you to sacrifice your son. And Abraham, being a man of faith, did exactly that. And it says that he saddled his donkey, and so probably him and his son were on the donkey, and he had two of his servants with them, and they took the wood, and a three-day journey, they got to the mountain where God told them to do that. And if you remember the story, Abraham took Isaac, and he left the servants there. And he said, hey, we're going to go and we're going to make a sacrifice and then we're, and then we're going to come back. That's what he said to him. The interesting part is Isaac was not a dumb kid. Isaac figured out that, wait a minute, we have wood, we have fire, but where's the sacrifice? And it's interesting that Abraham took the wood and he put it on Isaac and Isaac took the wood and he bore the wood up for the sacrifice. And if you remember the story, Isaac or Abraham builds the altar. He ties Isaac up, lays him on the altar and is ready to sacrifice him when God stops him with an angel saying, God has prepared a lamb for himself. And that's what Abraham believed that to be true. Now, if you think about that, and you think about the life of Jesus, you think that Isaac was of a supernatural birth. Not a virgin birth, but his parents were old, 100 years old, and they had a kid. So he had a supernatural birth. Isaac bore the wood that he was going to be sacrificed on, just like Jesus bore the cross that he was going to be sacrificed on. Something I found very interesting in, in looking over this was this. Isaac would have been the first sacrifice and the only sacrifice in the Old Testament that was sacrificed on the altar. All the other sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were killed and then put on the altar. Because Isaac was going to be sacrificed on the altar. And we know that Jesus, when he bore the cross and he was sacrificed for our sins on the cross, he died on the altar. He died as a sacrifice for all of our sin. And God told Abraham, and I thought this was interesting, God said um, that God will provide the lamb for himself. And when Jesus went to the cross, he provided the lamb for himself. It, I cannot fathom or understand this. It's beyond my mental capability. But God loves us so much that he basically realized we could never die for our own sin. No animal could ever die for our own sin. And the only way for God's holiness to be propitiated, which means to be satisfied, was by a perfect sacrifice. And the only perfect sacrifice that could ever be born would be for him to send his son and die on the cross, who lived a perfect life and died for our sins. And he took care of it for us. Everything was done by him for us. 
But God provided the lamb and Isaac's life was spared. I believe, and a lot of people believe, that Abraham truly believed that if he sacrificed his son, he knew that God's promise was that through his seed that many nations were going to be blessed, that, he, that God would resurrect Isaac. But we all know that next Sunday, we celebrate that God did resurrect his son, Jesus. And because of that resurrection, we are totally forgiven of all of our sin. And communion is nothing more than us remembering the sacrifice. We take the bread, and it represents our, his body that was beaten and given for us. We drink the cup, the juice, which represents his blood that was shed for us. And that's what communion is all about. And so if you're visiting with us today, we ask you, if you know Jesus, you've crossed that line of faith and you trusted him, it's his table. It's not our table. You're more than welcome to join with us today. If you haven't crossed that line of faith yet, you're not really sure about your walk or your relationship with Jesus, feel free not to participate. There's no pressure to do this. You get up on your own and you go and do it. How we celebrate communion here is we have a table in the front here, a table in the back over there, and a table in the back over there. And when you feel led, you just get up and you go and you grab the piece of bread that represents his body and you dip it in the, the juice that represents his blood. And then you just take that moment and say, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me. And you, and you participate. If you, have, if you have gluten issues, we have gluten-free communion. Full service church here at Compass. But that's what it's all about. And the Bible says this. It says, before we do this, it says, a man ought to examine himself before he eats the bread or drinks the cup. And that examination is nothing more than you just taking a moment between you and God and saying, Lord, maybe there's something in my life that's not right with you. And you know it and I know it and I want to make it right. I want to ask you to forgive me so that my heart is right before him when I go to the table and participate. So we're going to take a moment and bow our heads and we're going to pray together. I'll close that part by praying for us as a church family. And then when I am done, feel free to get up and go to the tables and uh, take communion. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful, um, so thankful for your great love for us that was demonstrated in your son Jesus. We believe with all our heart that we are so undeserving of all that you've given to us. But we are so thankful that you have saved us from our sin. You have cleansed us as white as snow. You have forgiven us of everything that we have ever done and ever will do. And that forgiveness gives us eternal life with you in a perfect place called heaven. And we are thankful for that. We do not deserve it. We've never earned it. But by faith, we believe you. And Lord, I lift up Compass today, and I just pray that if we have offended uh, you in any way, if we have done something in your eyes that is wrong or a sin, we pray that you would reveal that to us if we don't know what it is, and we ask forgiveness for that. Lord, we ask as a church, if we've offended anyone in our community, that you would help us to be able to make that right. And so, Lord, we, we seek your forgiveness. We're so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful that we can celebrate his death and what he did for us and remember it. You're so good to us. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's participate together. Yeah.
and saints Heal the blind, the lost, and the lame Even now he is in our midst Behold him He who chose a criminal's end Paid with blood to settle our debt Buried death as he rose to to come and sing a song with us, but they need help and inspiration. All right, little people. <laughs> and if you need to take a video camera or whatever, please feel free to jump in the front row. Oh, yeah. Already there. Already oh, there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chan's like, on it. Get it, girl. Go for it. Hi, guys. Right up here. Oh, yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah.
good and your mercy enduring forever. Lord, you are good, yeah. Lord, you are good and your mercy enduring forever. Forever and ever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation. our Lord and Savior, risen on the third day. Go ahead and take these with you. Remember, next Sunday, one service, 10 a.m. We love you guys. Happy Palm Sunday! Oh, and don't forget, choir practice right after church. No telling needed. <laughs>